Hey, welcome to Rise Church. Thanks so much for joining us online today. We believe that Jesus wants to do so much for you and through you, and we'd love to hear how he's working in your life. Please take a second to email your story to stories at rise-church.com. We hope you leave today feeling encouraged and uplifted. Enjoy the message. Maybe, we'll see. Winning the war in your mind is the series that we're in. This series we kicked off two weeks ago, and this is the most important message I think that I could ever teach in our church. And that's why we're kicking off this new year with it. If you stick around Rise Church long enough, you'll hear me teach this same message. I'll keep running the same message constantly because this is so huge. You're in a battle, a spiritual battle. You're in a war, and it's going on all around you. But before it goes on around you, it's happening right here in you. The devil is getting an all-out assault on your mind. He's feeding you lies constantly, all the time, and what I want more than anything in your life is for you to win this war in your mind. The Apostle Paul said these words. This is our theme verse for this series. We're gonna read it together on the count of three. Come on, if we all do it, it won't be weird. And you're reading God's word, so let's go. Come on, one, two, three. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul says, you want your life to be transformed? You gotta change the way you think. It's not by trying harder to be a better Christian. It's not even by praying more or reading the Bible more, although those things are definitely gonna help you. It's by renewing your mind, setting your mind, not on things of this world, but setting your mind, filling your mind with the things of God, and that is his word, that is prayer, that is worship, that is church, that is everything. You wanna be transformed? You gotta change the way you think. We got this series from a book I read by a pastor named Craig Rochelle, and in his book he said this, our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. So if you have anxious thoughts about something in your future, maybe it's financial, maybe it's health or whatever, and your thoughts are kind of controlled by that, no wonder you're gonna lose sleep at night. No wonder you're gonna walk in anxiety. Now, I understand that there is some real anxiety going on. I'm not trying to dismiss any of that, but I'm just saying, if your thoughts are consumed by that, that's the direction your life is gonna go. If you look around at our world and just go, this world's falling apart, all you're gonna do is see the negative, you're consumed with negative thoughts, that's where your life's gonna go. Your thoughts are stronger than you ever will know. And what we're trying to do in this series is to get you to come around this idea that the battle starts right here in the mind. And I don't know about you, but God changed my life. Anybody's life been changed by God? And God is such a good God that he knew that I needed to be able to hear a message taught in a way that would grab my attention. I'm a visual learner. If I can see it, man, I'll remember that forever. And God grabbed my heart at the age of 17 years old by a pastor preaching a message that he called the Tupperware Gospel. And if you were here last week, I preached that message. I've preached it multiple times at our church in the past. I'll keep preaching it because it's the message that changed my life. And when your life's been changed by something that good, you can't shut up about it. And so if you were here last week, you got to hear the Tupperware Gospel. If you weren't here last week, there is good news for you because we're bringing the Tupperware back. Come on, somebody. And so let me get you caught up on it. If you weren't here last week, this is you. Look at yourself. You look good, man. Come on, you look amazing. This is you. And the Bible says that when you were born, you had this huge problem. I mean, you had a major problem. The problem was called sin. And the reality is, That because Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, sin entered our world, you had no choice in the matter. When you were born, the Bible says that sin was in you. But not only was sin in you, you had a bigger problem than that. The Bible says that you were stuck in sin. And this is a huge problem. You don't need somebody to come alongside you in this state of your life and just go, oh, well, God bless your heart. You doing okay in there? Hey, do you need a hug? No, what you need is something radical to take place. 
You, you need something to happen for you that you cannot do for yourself. You need rescue. You need to be saved from this mess of your life because the reality is this, that sin leads to death. And if you die stuck here, if you breathe your last breath on this earth and this is your reality, the payment for sin is death eternal. God created heaven and hell. And his will is that we would all go to heaven, that none of us would perish. And he sent his son Jesus to pay the bill for your sin. And you can either let Jesus pay the bill or you can pay it for yourself. And if you try to pay it yourself, that is a debt you'll never be able to pay. And hell is your reality. But God loved us too much. John 3, 16 says he loved us so much that he saw us in this state and said, I love them too much for them to stay there. I'm gonna send my son. His name is Jesus. Somebody didn't know his name, so let's give you another chance. His name is Jesus. Come on, his name is Jesus. God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sin, for your junk, for your mess. 10 o'clock, I'm gonna need you to get a little more excited about that. Because <laughs> you're the worst ones in our church. That's why you come to the 10 o'clock. You're not holy and come to the early service. You're not, well, 11.30, they got issues too, but whatever. <laughs> Jesus came to die for your mess. He loved you too much to leave you here. And the moment you say, I don't wanna stay here anymore, I want rescue, I want salvation to come into my life, the moment you see your sin and your need for a savior and you call out to Jesus to come into your life, something miraculous happens, something supernatural happens, something we can't explain happens, but this is what happens, something like this. Jesus comes on and says, hey, that sin that's got a control of your life, I'm taking you out of sin. And not only am I taking you out of sin, I'm taking the sin out of you. You're not gonna be dominated and controlled by this anymore. This is who you are. But, but this isn't who you are. For the longest time, this is who I thought I was. I'm forgiven of my sin, and now I have to go be a Christian. And I don't know about you, but what I found is that I really stink at being a Christian. I'm not good at it. I can't really do it very good to the point where I almost gave up trying. And maybe that's where you find yourself. I know I'm forgiven, but I just can't get this Christian thing right. Something's not working. Raise your hand if you've ever been to Disney World. Better question, raise your hand if you've never been to Disney World. Your parents didn't like you as a kid growing up and they just, <laughs> just wouldn't take you. Okay, I'm so sorry. I would love to take you to Disney World one day. My family decided this year that we're gonna scale Christmas back, less gifts, and we're gonna do a family trip together. And we are gonna go to the happiest, happiest place on earth. Come on, and if you know, if you've ever been to Disney, you know that is a lie. Come on, somebody. They call it Disney magic. It's called Disney rage, okay? You know, you see parents yelling at each other. You see kids throwing fits, man. It is just, it's the happiest place on earth. Well, we went this week, this past week, and uh, we made the most of our trip. It was not the happiest place on earth for us because two of my three kids got sick while we were there, and plans got postponed, and everything got changed, and we made the most of it, and we got to spend um, a full day at, at my kids' favorite park, Hollywood Studios, and we got to ride my daughter's favorite ride, my middle daughter, 11 years old. Her favorite ride is the Tower of terror. And I love it too. I love all the rides. I'll ride everything. I have, I've been like that since a kid. And we went, man, we went, we got to the park before it opened and we stayed to the very end and we rode it all. We rode Tower of Terror like six times, rocking and rolling. And it was the last time that we were riding it. The park was about to shut down and I'm on with just my two kids. My wife's back at the hotel with our sick little one. And, and, and when we're going and, and Tower of Terror is where you, and then you drop and then you're up and then you drop, and then you're up, and then you just keep dropping, and then finally the last drop happens. When that last drop happened, I heard a clang, and I noticed that my phone fell out of my pocket 
into the Tower of Terror elevator bucket ride thing. And then I heard a thud. And I said, why did I hear a second drop? And I reached my hand down. I'm still buckled in. And I'm sitting against the wall. And I feel this small little gap on the floor of the elevator car. And as the ride, if you've been on it, as it retreats back, there's my phone at the bottom of Tower of Terror's elevator shaft. And I have wanted to unbuckle, but you can't. And I wanted to grab my phone, and I get off the ride, and I tell the guy, hey, my phone's right there. I saw it. Can I go get it? And he's like, no, you, he said a word I can't say in church. And the elevator, the, the next ride's coming down. You're going to have to come back here tomorrow and get your phone, and hopefully they find it, and, um, and, and you can get it. And so I go to bed, and praise the Lord for track my phone on my apps, and I, there it is, right at the bottom of Tower of Terror. And, um, and I could see that it was still at the park, and then it had moved to the gift shop, and that it was moving to the front. And so I go, and, and, and they say, Mr. Peterson, we've got great news for you. We found your phone. And how many of you know when somebody prefaces good news, there's always probably some bad news that's coming after us. And she said, and the bad news is your phone is cracked. And I don't know if you can see this. You can zoom in for the uh, online audience, but this thing is in 100 pieces. The good news is the front of my screen's not cracked at all. I just have this huge yellow blob that is now taking over half of my phone. Brand new, by the way. Just, just switch to a new carrier, buy one, get one free iPhones. I told my wife, I need to get a case on it before we go to Disney, just in case I drop it. And uh, That didn't happen, so she's, she loves reminding me of that right now. Thanks, babe. My phone, oh, camera's broken, audio's all out of whack, yellow screen, super fun, is not functioning right now the way that it should function and it's driving me crazy. That was me. This is not working. I am not really good at being a Christian, and it's driving me crazy. I'm forgiven of all of this. I wanna go after Jesus, but I just keep going right back to this. And when I saw the pastor preach this message, it was the light bulb moment that I had missed for so long. The reality is you cannot be a Christian. You can't do it. You don't have the power to do it. There's only one person who ever lived the perfect Christian life. His name is Jesus, Jesus Christ, that's where we get the word Christian from, little Christ. So if you wanna be a Christian, you need to tap into a power that you don't have. You need, come on somebody, Jesus Christ to come live, watch this, in you. Now you can do it. Now you got the power to live out the Christian life, not you, but Christ in you. But God doesn't stop there because not only is Christ in us, but the Bible says that, good news, come on, we are in Christ. This is, this is our identity, but it doesn't stop there because we bring out the big mama jamma. The Bible says that Christ himself is actually in God, which is awesome. And if you were here last week, I had a tape roller dispenser, and I said, and we're sealed up by the power of the Holy Spirit, but that was really messy and hard to do, and so I said, we'll take a break, but we believe in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that when Jesus resurrected, he said, good news, I'm sending you the helper who lives on the inside of us, the power of God in us, the Holy Spirit of God. Maybe you grew up in a church that didn't talk about the Holy Spirit. We do around here, because he's God. Let's go. Sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is your identity. Two amens. Two a too late. <laughs> this is your identity. This is who you are. You are no longer defined by this. This is who you are. A, a transfer, a transaction took place. You were stuck in sin. Now you're saved, redeemed, and rescued by Jesus 
Christ. Colossians 1.13 says it like this. He has rescued us. Come on, raise your hand if you've been rescued. Let's go. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. In 2013, one of my all-time favorite Jacksonville Jaguar players got traded. His name was Terrence Knighton. We drafted him in like the second or the third round. This dude was 6'3", 350 pounds, played on the defensive line. He was all right. He wasn't anything really like super special, but he was pretty good. And one of the main reasons I liked him is because he had a nickname. He liked to eat, and he liked to eat one food in particular. They called him pot roast. And I thought, I love pot roast. I'm making pot roast tomorrow night. Come on, somebody, let's go. Mississippi pot roast, come on, woo! Yeah, if you don't know about that, I just hooked you up. You're welcome. That was free. That's not even part of the sermon. And God, in his goodness, shined down on Terrence Knighton. And he was transferred from the kingdom of darkness, the Jacksonville Jaguars, to the Denver Broncos. A phone call happened. The Denver Broncos said, hey, we like pot roast. We like that guy. We want him on our team. We'll trade you X, Y, and Z for him. And a transfer took place. And he went from one of the worst teams in the NFL. Yes, I know, at 2013, we were still one of the worst teams. <laughs> Crazy. To one of the best teams in the NFL. The Broncos ended up going to the Super Bowl that year. They lost, but at least they went. We went nowhere. Still going nowhere. And Terrence Knighton, in a moment, went from a terrible team to an incredible team. Matter of fact, when he got to Denver, they gave him a brand new jersey with a new number. They gave him a new playbook. They gave him a new coach. Everything was brand new for him. Do you think Terrence Knighton showed up in that first meeting or that first practice and said, hey guys, I'd really like to tell you how we do it here in Jacksonville. <laughs> in Jacksonville, man, we, never mind. <laughs> no, man, that dude was excited, right? I went from like the worst team to the greatest team, one of the best teams, like a trans. This is what has happened for you. You went from darkness to light, from the kingdom of darkness into the family of God. This beautiful transfer took place. And I think the reality is this, that some of us are still living in this because we don't realize that the transfer was real. There's a whole new playbook you get to run. You got a new name, you got a new coach, there's a new way of doing things. And this no longer defines who you are. The Apostle Paul was an amazing man, started churches. This is what he would do. He would go to a certain town, he would preach about Jesus to people that had never heard about Jesus. These people would start believing in Jesus and then he'd say, all right, let me tell you about how we're gonna be a church and, and rows are good, but, but circles are better. Paul started small groups. He was the originator of that, the OG. And, and he, would, he would gather people together and we're gonna be the church and this is what it's gonna look like and he would put people in leadership and then he'd say, all right, I'll see y'all later. I'm gonna go to another town and I'm gonna preach the gospel there and I'm gonna start another church and I'm gonna go to another town and I'm gonna preach there and start another church. And he just went all around preaching the gospel about Jesus and starting churches. And he, he couldn't catch an Uber to get back to the churches that he started, and so he'd write them letters. And he'd address maybe some dysfunction that they were dealing with, or he'd answer some questions that they'd had. And he writes this to one of the churches that he started. And watch, you remember, when you're reading the Bible, you gotta remember this was a letter. Like they would've got it in an envelope, and they would've unrolled the skull, and they would've read it like a letter, just like you get letters in the mail. And they would've been like, everybody gather around! Paul wrote us a letter. And this is how he starts off that, that letter. To the dirty, rotten sinners at Colossae. To the saints. To the saints, to the faithful brothers. Sorry, sisters, I don't know what Paul's deal was. In Christ, at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God. This is how he starts the letter. Can you imagine if every time we gathered together, 
I welcomed you. What's up, Rise Church? You jacked up, messed up, pathetic, dirty, rotten sinners. So glad you're here today. Now, the truth of the matter is this. Before Christ, we are jacked up, dirty, rotten, gross sinners. But because of Christ, we have a new identity. He says to the saints. Other translations says to the holy ones. Show of hands, how many of you know you have been rescued from sin and you are in Christ Jesus? If your hand didn't go up, I'd love to talk to you afterwards because you should know that. Hey, maybe you have never put your faith in Jesus. I would love to talk to you afterwards. Raise your hand if you feel holy this morning. Couple hands. Some of you are like, I'm actually having a pretty good day. We don't go off of what we feel. We go off of what God says to be true. Is Jesus holy? Let me say that one more time because you're like, I'm not sure. Is, is this a trick question? <laughs> the answer is yes. Is Jesus holy? Yes. Where does Jesus live? So that means that holiness lives on the inside of you. Not only does holiness live on the inside of you, holiness encompasses you. So because Jesus is holy, get this. You have holiness in you. That, that is your identity. Is Jesus righteous? Yes. Is Jesus perfect? Yes. Are you perfect? No. But he is, and he's in you. So is righteousness and holiness and perfection possible? Absolutely, because Christ lives in you, his power. So for so many of you, you're walking around with the identity, with the mindset. Listen, it's all in the mind. I'm just a sinner. I'm saved by grace, and I'm forgiven, but I'm just a sinner. And if you think you're just a sinner, if your mind is consumed with the thought of, I'm a sinner, guess what you're going to do? But if your mind is consumed with, I am the righteousness of God. Christ lives in me. I, holiness is in me, holiness is possible, then you can live out a holy life because you're thinking about things that are above, Philippians says, things that are pure, things that are true, things that are good, things that are worthy, things that are holy. Amen. And when your mind is set on those things, guess what you're gonna walk out? Holiness. It, it's here. It's in the mind. But here's where the devil will come along. He'll come along and try to convince you yeah, you're here, but that's still who you are. And he will use condemnation to keep you from walking out your true identity. So what we need more than anything else is to know the difference between the voice of God and the voice of the devil. Conviction is from God. Conviction is from God. Condemnation is from Satan. Conviction is from God. Condemnation is from Satan. Conviction leads to life. Condemnation leads to despair. Conviction makes us want to change. Conviction makes us see where we are and go, I don't want to stay there anymore. Condemnation makes us believe we could never change. You tracking with me? One more. Conviction reminds us of our new identity in Christ. Condemnation tells us our failures define who we are. I need somebody to grab a hold of this. Conviction will tell us this is your, not your identity anymore. Condemnation will say you're going to be stuck here for the rest of your life. And condemnation will cause us to run from God. What did Adam and Eve do in the garden when they sinned? They hid from God. Why? Because they felt condemnation. It'll cause you to do the exact same thing. Conviction, you know what it'll do? It will always bring you back to Jesus. Thank you, God, that your Holy Spirit convicts us. So, so here's the reality. I'm in Christ, but when I go back to sin, when I go back to my old identity, conviction will come and go, that's not who you are anymore, and you don't have to stay there because God has something better for you. Condemnation will go, yeah, you're worthless, and that's all you'll ever be. So just camp out here for a while. 
Romans says it like this. There is therefore now, say it with me, no condemnation. Zero. Zero. Listen, for those who are where? In Christ Jesus. Meaning, if this is your identity, God's not up in heaven condemning you. So why are you letting the devil do it? Why are you doing it to yourself? If God's not doing it, why are you letting him? For the law of the spirit of life has set you free. Where? In Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. You're set free. It's not who you are anymore. So we packed up for Disney World. And I'm excited about the trip. My kids are jacked up out of their minds. Nobody's sick yet. Everybody's getting along. We're ready to rock and roll. We were packed up the night before. Load the car. Let's go. Now, how many of you love a good road trip? Okay. How many of you, whether you were a kid or even to this day, you got in the car and you were the first person that had to go to the bathroom when you got in the car? (laughs) Raise your hand if you very much disliked your siblings that had to take the bathroom break. Yeah, 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 me too, me too. How many of you, when you go on a road trip, you're the type of person that just wants to get from point A to point B as fast as you can? How many of you are all about the journey? I wanna go here, and then I wanna go here, and I know that Bucky's Bucky's is 30 minutes out of the way, but can we stop there? I need some, I need some, some Bucky treats, and yeah, 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 yeah. I'm the type of person that wants to get from where I am to where I'm going as fast as I can. The problem was, as a kid, I was Mr. Potty Break. We'd be 30 minutes into the trip, and I'd say, Dad, I can't hold it anymore. I got to go. And then my dad would yell at me, why didn't you go before we left? I didn't have to go then, Dad. And as an adult, guess what I found out? I'm still that person. 40 minutes into the trip, I got to go to the bathroom. So guess what I realized about myself? An hour before we leave for a road trip, I can't drink anything. I can't have a sip of nothing. And so I decided an hour before this trip, finish my coffee, we're done, ready to hit the road, I'm not drinking anything, we get in the car, and guess who has to use the bathroom? Not me, Rebecca! (laughs) Woo! Not me, I'm dehydrated over here, man. I'm just like, (sighs) (laughs) she's like, I gotta go. But this is what she said. She's not here this morning, she's home with one of our sick ones. She said, uh, she said, but I'm not stopping because I'm not letting you win. (laughs) <laughs> she held it in. What I realized about myself is I would get in the car and my bladder, I just couldn't hold it anymore. And so I had to change up some stuff in my life because I want to get from where I am to where I'm going. When it comes to your Christianity, when it comes to your walk with God, if you want to get from where you are to more of Jesus in your life, There are some things that you cannot hold on to anymore. You got to let them go so that you can grab a hold of God. And one of the mentalities you have to let go is this. I'll always just be a sinner. You got to let that one go. And you got to hold on to this truth. This is who you are. This is, I am in Christ Because I am in Christ and because he is in me, I have the power of God. I can walk a life of holiness and righteousness. I can run after the things of God. Temptation and sin don't have to own me anymore because I am holding on to who I am in Jesus. I love this verse out of John. Jesus said these words, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples then you will know the truth. And listen to what the truth will do. The truth will set you free. Let me focus in on these three yellow lines. You ready? Because I need somebody to grab a hold of this this morning. Because there's a guy in here right now. You are dominated by sin. You know what it is. It's got you. It's had you for a while. And What you're doing right now It ain't working. So you need to try something else. Because if you want to get from where you are to where God has you and where you want to be in Christ Jesus, you're going to have to change something up. You're going to have to drop some stuff so that you can hold on to more of who God is. So men, lock in with me real quick because I'm out of here to help you. 
Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, then you'll know it. You can't know it if you don't hold on to it. You can't get set free if you don't know it. You don't know it if you don't hold on to it. Confession about my life. I love Jesus with all my heart. But I sometimes in my life fill my mind with everything else other than God. I read my Bible, I pray, I worship. Obviously, I'm in church, I'm connected, I'm in groups, I'm doing everything that I tell you to do. But I'm also filling my mind with junk. Not sin, just junk. So I had to take a deep look into my life and go, God, if I want more of you, if I truly wanna walk in complete freedom, then I've gotta be able to identify what's the junk in my mind that I can get rid of so you can fill my mind with more of you. So that I can, what's the things I need to let go of so that I can hold on to more of you? And I'm telling you, you ready for this? I'm off Netflix. I don't watch it. Every once in a while, my wife and I will sit down to watch a movie together. But I'm not binge watching shows like I used to. I'm off social media. Let me tell you something. I wasn't sinning on social media. I wasn't looking at stuff I wasn't supposed to look at. I was just filling my time with it. Guess what I've got more than ever before? I got time. And now that I've got time, I can fill it. I've dropped some stuff, so now I can pick something up. Guess what I'm picking up more than ever before? God. I'm filling my mind with more of the things of God. I am holding on to God more than I ever have before. And let me tell you something. It feels really good. I, I, feel, I feel stronger spiritually than ever. I've got faith more than ever. I'm believing God for things like, like I've never believed before. And I'm telling you, the temptation's still there. It has lost its power, though. And it, I'm not up here to toot my own horn. Because if you asked me a year ago, I told you a different story. I was filling my mind with everything else. Temptation would get my number from time to time. But right now, I am holding on. I am literally... I am literally holding. I am, I am in Christ. He is in me. My joy is only found in him. There is nothing that can satisfy me other than you, Jesus. I'm reading God's word more than ever before. I don't know if that encourages you to hear that your pastor's reading the Bible. That should encourage you. I'm praying. I'm worshiping. Like it's in me. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you. And, and, and this stuff right here, it's not dominating my life, and it doesn't have to dominate you either. I'm gonna have the band come up. Let me say this in closing. Jesus went into the wilderness, and he was tempted by the devil. You know this story? The devil tempted him three times. If you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, do this. If you are the son of God, do that. And something happened before Jesus went into the wilderness. Do you remember what it was? He got baptized, right? Did Jesus have to get baptized? He didn't have to, but God told him to, so yes, he did. So that was a trick question. I got you. Woo! Preacher juke. And he gets baptized. And if you ask Jesus about the baptismal moment, he might have said something like this. Yeah, I got baptized. I know I was Jesus, but I went out there. John the Baptist baptized me. That dude was weird. He smelled a little funny, but he baptized me. This isn't in the Bible, but if you ask Jesus in heaven, he will tell you this. And Jesus comes up out of the water and Jesus would say, and then something crazy happened. Something ridiculous happened. Something supernatural happened. The heavens opened up and my father spoke to me and everybody heard it. And he said these words in Matthew 3, 17. This is my son whom I love with whom I am well pleased. And then immediately from there, Jesus went into the wilderness. And for 40 days and 40 nights, guess what? He didn't eat anything. He didn't drink. He fasted. He, he put some stuff to the side. And I guarantee you this. If you ask Jesus, Jesus, what did you do in those 40 days? He would tell you this. I held on to what my father said. Every day I woke up going, I'm his son. He loves me, and he's proud of me. I'm his son, 
He loves me and he's proud of me. I'm his son and he loves me and he's proud of me. For 40 days, he held on to that. And then the devil comes along and this is what the devil says. If you are the son of God, to which Jesus probably looked and said, if I'm the son of God, like weren't you at my baptism? Oh, you weren't there? Well, let me tell you what happened. I went down under the water. I came up. The heavens opened up. And God spoke these words to me. And for 40 days, I've been holding on to them. I'm his son. I'm loved. And he's proud of me. So the devil says, if you are the son of God, and Jesus is like, please, bro. (laughs) I've been holding on for 40 days that I am the son of God. I know exactly who I, I know my identity. So, so you ready? So the temptation didn't have a hold on him. So let me, let me ask you something, men. Let me ask you something, women. The temptation that you're fighting against right now, are you winning or are you losing? Because if you're losing, you might need to start fighting differently. You may just need a different strategy. And the good news is, God has it. He's laid it out. You hold to it. When you hold to it, you know it. When you know it, you're free. When you hold to it, you know it. When you know it, you're free. If you don't hold to it, you won't know it. And if you don't know it, you won't walk in freedom. And there's nothing I want more for you men and women as your pastor to see you walking in freedom. There's some great recovery programs in our world today, right? And when you go in, they'll have you confess something. And I understand what they're trying to do. And they'll say, my name is so-and-so and I'm a alcoholic. And they have you identify what you are. Jesus doesn't ask you to do that. My name is Adam. And I'm a son of God. He loves me. And he's, if he said it to Jesus, I promise you he's saying it to you. I'm a son of God. That's who I am. I'm gonna drop this stuff so I can hold on to more of Jesus. And I'm telling you, watch out. Because the victory over that temptation that's had your number is on its way. Let's pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Thanks for watching today. If you'd like to continue the conversation, you can like us on Facebook or follow us on Instagram. If our church has had an impact on you and you'd like to support all that Jesus is doing in this place, you can do so by going to rise-church.com slash give and select the giving option that best suits you. Thanks so much for joining us online and we hope you have a blessed week.